Tim's looking at me. He's like, when do we start? You can start whenever. <laughs> um, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Luke 13. Luke 13. We're going to be in verses 18 through 30. And let me just set the context for you before we read that. Jesus had just spoken to a crowd of people who were following him about repenting. And if they didn't repent, that they would perish. Because in Galilee, the Galileans, this is the only time in Scripture where this is recorded that we know of. We don't know exactly what happened. But Pilate apparently had killed some Galileans with a sacrifice. And their blood was mingled with that sacrifice. And people were thinking, as we always do when something bad happens to somebody else, wow, what did they do to deserve that? Why did God pour out his wrath? And Jesus, seeing their hearts, comes to them and says, you think it was because of what they did? No. You are just as sinful as them. And unless you likewise, if you do not repent, you likewise will perish just as they did. And then he tells the parable of the barren fig tree, how uh, the master of the tree went for three years and there was no fruit on the tree. And he said, cut that tree down. And the servant said, wait, 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 let me put manure on it. Let me fertilize it for one year. And if after one year it doesn't bear fruit, then you can cut it down. Again, an image of repentance. And then we see a woman with a disabling spirit. Jesus meets her and she's bent over. She's been bent over for 18 years. And Jesus comes up and he says, stand up, you're healed. And everybody's like, wow, the only problem is it was the Sabbath. So guess what the Pharisees do? They do what the Pharisees do best. And they be Pharisees. <laughs> and they say, Jesus, you can't heal on the Sabbath. And he says, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water? And ought not this woman, or daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? And look what verse 17 said. And, and he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame. And all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. So that's the context of where we just came from in scripture. And it brings us to the parable of the mustard seed and the leaven and the narrow door, which is what we're going to get to today. So if you could, please rise. We're going to read God's word. Luke 13, 18 through 30. He said, therefore, what is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden. And it grew and it became a tree. And the birds of the air made nests in its branches. And again, he said, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. He went, away on his, he went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And people will come from east and west, and from north and south, and recline at table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some who are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. Thank you. You may be seated. See, Jesus, just before everybody's eyes, just made a woman with a crippling spirit stand up straight. And so when you see somebody perform a miracle, your first gut reaction is to say, okay, I'm pretty much going to believe everything that they're going to say because they seem to have some power and some abilities that are supernatural. So now Jesus begins, and it's interesting because right after he heals this woman, he turns to talk in parables. And parables are stories, narrative stories, that Jesus speaks to tell explicit, singular truths that we can understand about the spiritual reality of the kingdom of God. 
Okay, I'm going to say that again. We, in, in a different way. This is not postmodern America. We do not have the right to determine what Jesus means. Jesus has a meaning. Our job in studying the scriptures, and hopefully my job this morning, is to bring out of the scriptures the meaning that Jesus is intending for us to know about the kingdom of God. And that meaning is really simple. And this message this morning is titled, A Kingdom Coming. And Jesus is speaking about the kingdom of God coming. It's interesting that he does that, considering he just worked in the physical realm. But now he says in verse 18, he said, therefore, what is the kingdom of God like? Notice that he does not, nobody raises their hand and say, whoa, whoa, whoa what are you talking about? Is there such a kingdom? This man, <laughs> people are like, this is Jesus. He's been healing people. He, he raises people from the dead. If he says there's a kingdom, there probably is one. And so he says, not, is there a kingdom? He says, what is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? Revelation gives us the consummation, a picture of the consummation of the kingdom of heaven. Listen to this, Revelation 21, 1 through 8. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. To the one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexual, immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. It's interesting because the Jews were expecting Jesus to come back and try as the Messiah. If, he's, if you claim to be the Messiah, we've got some expectations. And that number one expectation is, why in the world are the Romans still conquering us? We're, we were expecting you to come and overthrow the, this, this regime and, and take this world by force. And so when he's not doing that, that's part of the reason why the Jews believe that he's not the Messiah. Because we're still in bondage to the Romans. Because they're expecting, like Revelation 21, 1 through 8, like we just read, the kingdom of God to show up and Jesus to come like he's going to come to when he comes again with a sword on his thigh and a name that only he knows written there. And he will slay all of his enemies. And you're like, I want to be on his team when that day happens. <laughs> and we heard about the greatness of the kingdom and how great it sounds. There's... there's Everything great, every longing of the human soul, every longing of the human physical body fulfilled perfectly in that kingdom. And I'm like, I want that. And so Jesus says, what is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? Well, there's two questions that he's about to answer for us in these, the parable of the mustard seed, the leaven, and the narrow door. The first question about the kingdom of heaven and about its coming is that the kingdom is small, but it's growing. The kingdom is small. It's hard to notice, but it's growing. Look at what he says. To what shall I compare it? It's like a, mustard, it's like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden, and it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air made nests in its branches. Did you know that the mustard seed was the smallest known seed to Jesus' audience? I don't know if you guys know what deer ticks are. They're like the bane of the outdoorsman existence. They can give you Lyme's disease. They're just really annoying. And they're really, really small. A mustard seed is about the size of a deer tick, but it grows into a tree that is about 12 feet high. But when you plant that itty-bitty little seed, if you had never known or seen a mustard seed before, you're going to expect what? 
an itty bitty little plant. But that's not how the kingdom of heaven works, Jesus says. We plant what is small, and what seems small right now in this reality is growing into something that the world had no idea was coming, that we wouldn't have known unless God told us how big and how glorious it was. Jesus said in Luke 17, later on in this book, being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. For will they say, look, here it is, or there? For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. That's what, what Jesus is saying, is the kingdom of God is already here. And he's saying, look at me. I brought it. I am the kingdom. I am the king. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am all of the things that you're longing for. I'm it. But at the same time, we live in this already not yet tension that we see, yeah, the kingdom of God's here, but we just heard all the prayer requests that we have this morning. My shoulder, we've got cancer, we've got bodies wasting away, we've got sin that we struggle with every single day to fight and overcome. God, you say it's here, but why, why are we still struggling? Why, why are tears still being shed? Why do I still feel pain? Why do I lose faith in moments? Because there's a kingdom that's still coming. And so we live in this dynamic tension where we have the constant assurance that the mustard seed is growing into the tree, but it's not the tree yet. <laughs> We're not there yet. And so we take hope in that. In 1971, Liberty University was founded. I don't know if you know that. I was actually asked this morning why I went to Liberty, and the reason is because of the number 1971. For a school to go from zero to hero in that amount of time, let me just tell you just a few things that I know about Liberty. It's one of the largest Christian institutions in the world. I'm not just talking about educational institutions, just largest institutions, period. Liberty University is right up there. It has over 100,000 students in residential and online graduate and undergraduate programs. It started in 1971. We have Liberty now has approximately $2 billion, with a B, dollars in assets. It started in 1971, y'all. That is crazy. If that's not a miracle, if that's not a little mustard seed that Jerry Falwell planted a few years ago that has grown and been nurtured into something that is blowing the minds of the world, I don't know a better example to say, this is what a little faith does. And it, <laughs> this is what a little faith does. It grows into something great. Why? Not because of how small the seed is. Look, check this out. It's not about how small the seed is, it's about how great, how great the God is. Because you can have the greatest seed in the world, but if you have a small God, it doesn't grow that big. But if you've got a small seed and a great God, with God, nothing is impossible. So we see that the kingdom is small, but it's growing. I want you to notice several points about the comparison of the kingdom of the God with seeds and with leaven because he goes on and he makes a similar comparison in verse 20. To what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leaven. I want you to know three points that, that he makes. First of all, God is not asking you to conjure up some new element. He's not asking you, well, you know, I, I'm asking you to, to, to have faith in me, but you need this certain thing to do it. No, he's saying, use these little items that I've already made in this world and do what with them? Put them to work. The mustard seed, what happens to it? It gets sowed, it gets planted. The leaven, what happens to it? It gets hid, it gets put, kneaded into the three measures of flour. In order for faith to produce results, it has to be put to work, right? It has to be put to work. You've heard time and time again, you, I, you hear it in college all the time. Yeah, I'm, I'm a great whatever, singer. Okay, let's hear you sing. Well, I only sing on the weekends. What? See, if you're a great singer, you would be singing. If you're a great man of faith or a great woman of faith, you would be what? You would be walking in that faith and your mustard, your little seed, these little deeds every single day of I'm not going to look at that 
on my phone. I'm not gonna watch that on TV. I'm going to trust God with my money. I'm gonna trust God with my relationships. I'm gonna whatever. These little acts that you're sowing every single day are soon gonna grow into a lifestyle and a way of living that is going to bear fruit that everybody sees. And it all starts with nothing that's out of the ordinary, but you just sowing and putting faith to work in your everyday life. Allowing the kingdom of God to be what it is. Allow the kingdom of God to flow out of you. Allow God to say, Lord, as for me, I am poor and needy. I don't have the strength to overcome whatever sin maybe you'd be bound up in. Gossip, whatever, pornography. God is greater than all of these things and he can, if we just throw our hands up and say, Lord, I need your help. I need this mustard seed to grow into a tree because right now I've been watering and watering and watering and nothing has happened. But the Bible says that God brings the growth. So if you're not seeing growth, it's really simple. Ask. Ask for growth in whatever area of your life for the glory of God. Lord, say, Lord, I need growth in this area because right now, This mustard seed is going nowhere. It's just this itty-bitty little seed. And finally, the true kingdom always produces results. Let me tell you about a guy who didn't really have a significant life until an instantaneous moment. It seemed so insignificant until this one moment. And his name is Joseph. And you probably know the story of Joseph, right? He gets sold into slavery by his brothers, and he gets put in Potiphar's house as a slave, and he's good looking, and Potiphar's wife is like, yeah, what's up? And he continues to resist, and he resists, and he resists, and he resists, until finally one day she corners him. Beware, man, beware of the brazen ones, hey, come on. She corners him, and she's like, lie with me, and he's like, no, I can't. I can't sin against my God. This would be a sin against my God. So he runs away and leaves his cloak behind. And for his faithfulness to God, guess what he gets? Thrown in prison. Wow. Thank you, Lord, right? You can just imagine Joseph that day. What? <laughs> I mean, he, he, he knew Bible stories. He saw oh, the faithfulness of Noah and how he's delivered from an ark. And he's thinking, God, you've done all these great things for these other people in their faithfulness. And here I am faithful and I get thrown into a pit. But he doesn't allow the mustard seed. He doesn't pull it out of the ground and throw it away. He continues to say, Lord, I'm going to trust you for the growth. And he remains faithful and faithful and faithful. And finally, one day he gets a knock on the door. After the men who had he told, he told them their dreams got out, it was two or three years later, They go to Pharaoh after Pharaoh's having this crazy dream about crazy cows that are eating other cows and wheat that's eating other wheat. And he says, bring that man up here. And in a moment, Joseph is exalted to the second highest position in Egypt. Why? Because he was faithful. He was trusting in God in the small, everyday, seemingly unimportant tasks And God recognized his faithfulness and exalted him to a great, great place. Why? Joseph's story doesn't end there. That faithfulness that Joseph was exhibiting was so that God could bring Israel to Egypt, so that he could make Israel great in Egypt. And then that for 400 years they would be oppressed, and then for the glory of God's name, he would deliver his people and get victory over Pharaoh. Why? All because Joseph was faithful way back in the day with something that seemed so small. It's because he said, I'm not going to go there. I'm going to trust my God. Even if it means that I rot in prison the rest of my life, I'm going to trust my God. Because of his faithfulness, Israel is brought to Egypt. They grow into a great nation. Pharaoh gets afraid. God says, I'm going to deliver my people. He does and gets victory over his people. Isn't that amazing? Our God is so faithful, even when we're faithless. See, the kingdom is coming. The kingdom is growing. What does it look like? What does it look like? 
It looks like everyday acts of faith. It looks like everyday acts of faith that seem really small, like when you're in high school and there's a girl who doesn't have any friends and you, in the love of Christ, go over and you sit next to her. Or there's a guy on the the football team or whatever team you're on and he has no idea what he's doing by looking at porn. He has no idea. Hey, did you know that you're made in the image of God? These little acts of faith, these little seeds that we plant that we do not know how God is going to use them later on in the future. Because Joseph, just being faithful in one thing that seems so small, caused an entire nation to be delivered for the glory of God. What does it look like? It looks like little acts of faith every single day. That little prayer in the morning, Lord, give me today my daily bread and let me forgive those who sin against me as I forgive those who trespass against me, right? These little They seem so insignificant, but they're soon growing into a great tree. But you know what? The opposite is true as well. Every day that we continue to lose and lose and not have faith and not have faith, guess what? That's growing into a tree as well that's producing extremely bad fruit. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Walls are built by small bricks. And if you think that your wall is going to support the weight of a life that you want to bring glory to God and, those, and, and you're, just, you're filling it with bricks that are false or not true or crooked, eventually that wall will come crumbling down and you will wonder why and it will be because of all those small little moments in your life that you thought didn't matter but that were actually growing into something really big. Then Jesus goes on and he, it took me a while to Figure this out. He goes on to tell us the parable of a narrow door. Like, what What does this have to do with seeds and bread? And then I finally figured it out, that the kingdom of coming, what does it look like? It looks like small, little acts of faith every single day. And then he answers a question that is really, really important. If this great kingdom is coming, how do I get in? How do I gain access to that kingdom? And he went on his way through towns and villages, verse 22 says, teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? Eh, wrong question. That's what I love about Jesus. He doesn't even respond to people's questions sometimes because he he hears them ask a question and he says, I'm not gonna tell you what you're asking. I'm gonna tell you what you need to know. Because you don't need to know how many people are going to be saved. On um, April 14th, 1912, and into the morning of April 15th, 1912, the Titanic was going down real fast. And I can guarantee you that nobody was lined up in a line next to the captain saying, excuse me, sir, we would like to know how many people are going to be saved today. You know what everybody was doing? Running as fast as they could to get either a life jacket and get in a lifeboat or just get off that boat into a boat as quickly as they could to be saved. Not to worry about if anybody else was going to make it, but if I don't get in a boat, I'm not going to make it. And so that's the, that's the issue that Jesus turns to. And he says, strive to enter through the narrow door in verse 24, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. You can just imagine that kid, you know, like the eager kid in the class. He's like, wait, that's not what I asked you. I asked you how many people will be saved. And what Jesus is, the point he's making to this person is it's not how many are, be, are going to be saved. Jesus is like, there's something way more important to be worried about. Are you that's, that's Jesus' main point right here. He's like, are you actually going to get into the kingdom? And he says, if you want to get in, this is how you get in. Strive, work. That's what that word means. You know, exert. It's not easy. Sin is easy, right? We all know it's really easy to give into temptation. It's really easy to gossip. It's really easy to lust. But it's a whole lot harder, and I've said this before, if, you know, you you picture sin as like a dam 
It's a whole lot harder to hold back a dam than it is to let it go and to kayak down that river. No amens. <laughs> so he says, strive. Why? Because entrance into the kingdom of God is not easy. Guys, this faith thing, it's easy, right? We just trust God. That's what faith is, taking him at his word. Except we put that into practice at every single day, and it's not always easy. Sometimes it means that I have to give up this relationship, or I have to give up this money, or I have to give up this dream, or whatever. It's not always easy. So we have to Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, Jesus said, will enter and will seek to enter and will not be able. Jesus made clear, what is the door? In John 14, five through seven, Thomas asked him, Jesus had said, I'm gonna be leaving you, but you can come to where I'm going. And Thomas says, hey, TV time out. We don't know where you're going. So how do we know the way? And Jesus answered him, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. See, now Jesus turns to tell another parable of what's gonna happen on the day when the kingdom of God finally comes in just rock-solid reality, when it falls to this earth and there is no more time to question whether or not the kingdom is real, to question whether or not Jesus Christ is real. That day, everybody, as C.S. Lewis says, will bow, not because they willingly do, but because it's impossible to stand. Because of the glory of the majesty of God, that he dwells in inapproachable light. He is a consuming fire. Every single man who ever comes in contact with God falls down as though dead. This is the God of the universe that we're dealing with, which is why we're really hesitant when we hear people say, yeah, I saw God. Really? Where's the humility? Where's like the fear of God in your being and in your bones? Because it's amazing that you're alive. <laughs> Moses sees his back, and people can't look at the face of Moses because it's radiating with brilliant light. And he saw the back of God, whatever that means. <laughs> so Jesus says, let me tell you something. The kingdom is gonna come, and once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us. Then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. You see, he paints an image of the moment when the glory of the kingdom has arrived and the longings of the human soul are fulfilled just by looking at the kingdom. It's like when you're driving an old beater car and you see somebody roll up in a BMW and somebody's like, which one do you want? You're like, mm, let me think about that for five seconds. I want the amazing one. The one that the brakes work, right? That's what the kingdom of heaven, when the kingdom of heaven comes, everyone who now thinks this earth is great would be like, that was garbage compared to that. The only problem is that not everybody gets in. So Jesus is saying, this is how you get in that kingdom, the kingdom that I'm bringing, the kingdom that's here, that's growing, that's really small, that's unnoticeable. You can't really see it, but when it comes in its fullness, you wanna be a part of that kingdom. Jesus makes them, he's like, it's like a starving man when that kingdom comes and he's knocking at the door. And, and the master, what does he say? You begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us. Then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. It was really important, and I just read in Joshua 9, the Gibeonite deception. The Gibeonites were a people who were neighboring the Israelites who were not Israelites. And they came and the first question when they came to Joshua is he asked them, where do you come from? Why? Because if I know where you come from, then I know whether you're my people or not. And I know whether you're a friend or an enemy. Because in order to protect a kingdom, you need what? Protection. In order to protect a kingdom, you need great walls. Which is why Solomon says in Proverbs, a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without 
walls. When we can't every day, and I think Francis Chan said this on Friday, let's, ex- let's exercise a little bit of self-control. Why? Because God has given it to us. God has given us the ability to reject sin, not just to reject it, but to reign over it and to roll over it. That is no dominion over us because the God who is in us is greater than the one who is in the world and all of the world because Christ said, take heart, I have overcome what? The world and all that it contains. So we don't need, if you're struggling some night on your bed or you're struggling whatever, Just throw your hands up and say, Lord, I need your power to overcome this. And watch him just crush your enemies. Hashtag crushing it, right? (laughs) But it's a major bummer. And it's like a man starving and thirsty from days without food or water. And he's crawled through the desert. And he stands outside of the banquet hall. And he knocks. And the man comes to the door. And he's peering through the window. And he's like, we don't know you. And you can just see him like slide down the glass like, oh no. (laughs) The despair that floods your soul when you see men eating and drinking and you've walked for three days with no food and water and you can't get in. Can you just like sit and think about that for a second? Because Jesus is painting these parables, remember, They are rock-solid images of the reality of the spiritual realm that is coming, that is here but not fully here yet. The rock-solid image that a lot of people are going to long, everybody's going to long to be in that kingdom because it's better than any kingdom that has ever been or ever will be and will last forever and everybody wants to be in but it's hard to get in and Jesus is saying, this is the way to get in. you got to strive to go through the narrow door. I am that door. But then what people are going to do, and you think this isn't you, apart from Christ, this is all of us. What does Jesus say? Then you will begin to say, remember we just got shut out, this person just got shut out of the kingdom. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. What they're saying is, they're like that guy on the door, but I know, I know you. It's like you like Duck Dynasty. And you see Cy Robertson walking around, and you're like, hey, Cy, what's up? You know him by name. Why? Because you see him all the time on TV if you watch that. And he's going to say, I don't know who you are. You're not invited to my birthday party. Why? Because I don't know who you are. (laughs) Then you will begin to say, yeah, but we ate and we drank in your presence. And you taught in our streets. Many on that day are going to say, Jesus, listen, this is really, really important. This is probably the greatest point that I want to make today. Jesus, we know who you are. We know about your kingdom. We knew that your kingdom was coming. We know. But the sh- the, one of the greatest, <laughs> in the words of Shri, major bummer. <laughs> but he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me all you workers of evil. That means no admittance, do not pass go, do not collect $200, there's no second chances, you are not getting in, the end of the story forever. See, the point isn't to know about God's kingdom. The point isn't to know about Jesus. The point isn't to know about morality. The point isn't to know about all of these things. The point is to know the king. If you do not have a relationship, and this is the point of this parable, if you do not have a relationship with the king, you do not enter the kingdom. If you do not have a relationship with the king, you do not enter the kingdom. If the king does not know you, you can say, I watched you on TV, I read all your books, I have these things signed from you on my fridge. It does not matter. He doesn't know you. You're not invited. And that is a really sad day. And Jesus goes on to say how sad it is. In verse 28, he says, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, which is just a way of saying that there is great mourning. Like, you forgot it was Sunday, and you're at Chick-fil-A, and you're like, 
weeping and gnashing of teeth, right? I think, I don't know for sure, but I think that not getting into the kingdom of heaven will be worse than that. But not getting into Chick-fil-A on a Sunday is pretty bad. See, and here's the worst part. Then you will see, not just that you're not in, but that you see people happy and rejoicing and full and satisfied and not longing for anything. Then you will see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets of the God, of the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. Jesus is saying there is a major chasm fixed. There is a major gap that you cannot get to. That you're going to sit there and you're going to see all of who do Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the prophets in the kingdom of God represent? Everyone who's walking by faith. Everyone who in their life has trusted God by faith for salvation. Period. And that means you if you're trusting God for salvation in Jesus Christ. Because again, this isn't about what you know or what you did or who you are. This is about does the king know you or not? That's how you get in. And this is the point that Jesus is making. It's so important. Not about is everybody else making it? Am I making it? Well, do I know the king? That's the question that I gotta ask myself. Christ brings it back to the main point of the gospel. If you do not know Christ, you do not know God. John 14, 23 through 24 says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words and the word which you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. Look, did Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and the prophets do everything perfectly? No. And you can go back and read their stories. Abraham. God promises, hey, you're going to have a son. But he looks at his watch and he's like, mm, that hasn't happened yet, so I'm going to make that happen myself. <laughs> and the whole world bears the consequences to this day of Ishmael fighting against Isaac. You wonder why the Middle East is under, at rest? It's because a long, long time ago, one of the faithful, Abraham, who is in heaven, because he walked in faith, lost faith for a moment. See, this isn't about us, remember? This is about knowing the king. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm cheap, preaching some cheap grace. Well, I know Jesus, so I can do whatever I want. No, actually, he just said, if you love me, you will keep my word. And he who does not keep my words does not love me. Ooh, ouch, how's that going? <laughs> the way I used to explain it to kids is like, look, you tell your mom you love her and you keep kicking her in the shin. I love you, wham, I love you, wham, I love you, wham. And you wonder why you're not, why you're in, you know, grounded all the time? <laughs> but we say, Jesus, I love you but I don't really want to do what you say. Do we really love him? Do we really know the king? Because the evidence of us knowing the king will be us loving him by what? Keeping his commands. And then finally, in verse 29, 30, the people will come from the east and the west and from north and the south and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. Don't you love that? Just feet kicked up. Get me some wine. Let's have some chicken. Let's dance. Party. I love that image. Just recline. Kick him back. We are satisfied. I pray every single morning because every, my heart is always longing to steal what God already gives. Lord, satisfy me in the morning with your steadfast love that I may rejoice and be glad all my days so that I can go throughout my day with my feet kicked up, satisfied by my God. Not longing or looking for anyone or anything to give me what God already gives. Because that's what the kingdom of heaven is like. And notice that people from the east and the west and the, from the north and the south will all recline at God's table. That means that from all over the globe, as far as the four corners spread, those who are trusting in Christ for salvation, who know the king by faith, 
are invited to the party. Get to enter the kingdom. You see, that's the narrow door. Faith in Jesus Christ alone plus nothing. Not in what you do, not in the fact that you go to liberty, not in the fact that you're a good person, not in the fact that you know a lot about Jesus, not in the fact 